couple of weeks ago, I had to reshoot a whole video because I hadn't realized that the camera wasn't recording the first time. And you all in the comments were like, this happens to you all the time. This happens way too often, Dale. How does this keep happening to you? And I, I thought that was an exaggeration. I thought that was baloney. It hasn't happened that recently. It doesn't happen that often. And today I have to eat crow a little bit um, <laughs> because recently I recorded an Appendix N interview with Emily Hare, who's the artist behind Strange Hollow and Surviving Strange Hollow sponsored this video and the link is in the description. Um, so many things went wrong with the scheduling and the tech in the process of getting that video recorded, but we finally, we battled through it only for me to discover that um, my microphone actually hadn't been recording for some reason for the first 15 minutes of the interview. Emily's audio is fine. I still have all of her top-notch answers to my questions. Uh, I just have no idea what my questions were. So uh, what I've done is I have contracted a high-end lip reader to actually figure out what on earth it is that I'm asking her. So what you're about to hear is an exact recreation of my interview questions. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. I'm so excited to have a guest with me here today. It's Emily Hare. Hello, welcome to the channel. Woo, yes, woo, <laughs> yes, this is my voice. This is what I sound like. Okay, nope, nope, that that isn't going to work. Even, even a little bit, I take it all back. We're just gonna have to skip to the parts where I actually did have audio. <laughs> I feel personally betrayed by technology. I feel attacked. Okay, all right. Where were we? What were we talking about? You were telling me about your journey through Medium. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I think I got to, like, in my late 20, 2004. Yes. Can't remember. I, I, I met up with, well, I've been chatting with a whole bunch of artists online, which was run by Liam Sharp, who's a comic artist that I know. Well, this is how I met him. He was running a message board. And we all used to share art on there. And that was when I was learning digital art. And I was like super bad at it at that point because I'd grown up with traditional media. So then that kind of got me into meeting up with these comic people. I ended up getting involved in comics a little bit, not not doing sequential art, but I did do a couple of, um, thanks to Liam, a couple of little uh, illustrated stories as part of his anthology comic, which was really good. And that led me to trying to get illustration work, which I did for on and off, or I say on and off, on along the side of normal jobs. I say normal <laughs> jobs, you know what I mean? Non, Non-art jobs uh, for the next 13 years. I think it was 13 years or thereabouts that I was doing uh, digital. And then I gave up digital in 2016 or the end of, and that's when I decided to start Strange Hollow. But it wasn't strange hollow then it was like i really struggled with um a style so i i, I was always i was like oh i want to paint this oh i want to paint that i didn't do like a collection of things which were necessarily the same same style i thought to me it seemed like my you know like i could see i'd done it but it wasn't a cohesive like oh that's that's an emily hair um, straight away and that, that was some of the feedback I would get all the time like you know you just you don't have a cohesive style so I thought right I'm gonna go back to traditional and uh, I'm gonna give myself a, a task to do in order to try and like do something that all happens in the same world so I said right I'm gonna I'm going to paint the, the inhabitants of an enchanted forest and I'll do that on Patreon so back then I started a Patreon and that's basically the sort of where it started I just start the first book I wasn't really thinking very hard about what it was going to be like I did think I, I was thinking oh yeah it's going to be really dark and moody <laughs> not dark and moody at all but I kind of discovered a way of painting with with watercolor the reason I chose watercolor is because it's it's not you know you don't need loads of space it's not smelly we were living in a really small place at the time so that's kind of why I went back to watercolor and and that's when Strange Hollow started to happen and it was only late later on that I I thought of a name for this forest I don't know where I'm going from I, I have I gone off on the tangent I'm not no sure. that's I I think that's so fascinating particularly the impact that practical elements can have on the eventual sort of artistic expression. That idea that it really can come down to something as simple as, well, this medium works with my current living situation. 
Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, like watercolor is so it's 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 amazing, but it's also really it's quite restrictive. You know, you can't paint generally paint over what you've done. You have to make sure that you go from light to dark. But that gives you a restriction as well. That that's going to affect how what you do looks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you, you did mention um, your love for nature documentaries, which is, yes. it's it's been something that's really um, interesting to me looking through your work, seeing this influence of, you know, just so much presence of magic and, you know, this, this overwhelming fantasy at the same time as bringing to it that kind of documentary quality. It's like you were documenting these creatures that don't exist. Yeah, I wanted them to, to be connected. Like the first book, I, there was a bit of connection going on, but I wasn't really concentrating on that. But by the time I did the sec second book, interestingly, I didn't, after the first book, I was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to do it another one. You know, I didn't, I wasn't absolutely sure. And so it was about, I think it was about two years after I did The Secrets of Strange Hollow, which was the second book. And that, I suddenly there were loads of rules that had appeared when I, like, I had to, like, figure out where everything was. So I had to do a map, a crap map. But uh, it was, you know, I so I knew, like, where, north, south, east, west, where I'm referring to, so that people weren't reading it going, well, actually, this <laughs> This isn't correct, or whatever, you know, if someone was <laughs> noticing that nothing, like, connects to each other. But yeah, all these rules in the second book appear. Rules like, like, fantasy creatures often get dressed in human clothes. None of that. I don't want, I want, because they're animal, they're like, they're creatures. They're not, they're not uh, civilized in that, you know, they're not wearing clothes. They don't care about clothes. Um, just like, just like any other animal <laughs> in the forest. They're not walking around with uh, hats on or whatever, um, I kind of have a bit of a problem with that, even though I know it's very popular so for some reason. I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to put them in human clothes because it's like they're not human. And I, yeah, they're just and, and I wanted to, I think I, I definitely lent more into the nature side of it than the magic side of it with the second book, or at least I feel like that's what I did. But even the stuff that is nature based, I, I think you know, there's definitely a magic, a magical in that they're not, they're not understood. Right, right. Yeah, so, they're immediately magical because they're exotic. Or mm. My sister something. would call it. Um, she she says that some things are zip zap boing magic, because <laughs> or, or, or technically, I think she the first time she called it um, boobity boop home alone with wizards when she was talking about magic that's a little bit um, in your face like. I wave my magic wand and I say these magic words, abracadabra, and you um, explode or whatever. She was like, that's, yeah. that's zip zap boring magic. That's home alone. Yeah, and there's like, like big, big, you know, like a, a, a flash of light or a puff of smoke. I, I often put a question to <laughs> my, my viewers, and I'm sure that they're sick of it by now. Um, but we talk about, you know, um, high fantasy settings and low fantasy settings. Is there a lot of fantasy? Is there? Is it much more grounded in reality and gritty and dark uh, and Game of Thrones? Mm. Um, but I, I often like to defy that um, dichotomy because I don't think it's necessarily um, strictly helpful because something can have a lot of magic but also feel very grounded or things like that. I like to say um, that I enjoy pervasive magic, magic that is everywhere but it's very difficult to control or to understand. If you had to, uh, what kind of phrase would you give the, the, for lack of a better term, magic level in Strange Hollow as a setting? <laughs> Ooh. Well, I think, I, I mean, I kind of think of it as a living thing because, I mean, it is a living thing, but it's interesting though because I don't really think about it as magic. I mean, it, I mean, the word enchanted forest or the, 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 the words enchanted forest imply magic. Um, and I think, I think that nature is magic. You know, like, what we see in nature is just crazy. And, 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 and so it's sort of, it's probably more low, low fantasy. I suppose, due to that, but there are magic people in there, like like there or magic. There's a, there's wizards and witches in there, who are obviously able to perform magic. But is that zip zap? What is it? <laughs> zip zap boing magic. Is it zip zap boing magic, or is it like you know herbalism and you know the, the there's um the fairy collector who is a non magical witch who steals the magic from the fairies. In order to make her magic, that that is 
that, that's more the zip zap boom maybe a little bit i don't know Which... if it is zip zap boom because it i and maybe i'm just saying that because i really like it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, that's one of my favorite um, sections that I've read. I have, I, I started taking notes, frankly, I started taking notes uh, on lots of the different creatures and, and characters that uh, you had written about just to make sure that I had information that I was referencing from while I was working uh, on my narrative that's going to be in Surviving Strange Hollow that's on Kickstarter right, right. now. Um, <laughs> That's good. That was my plug. But I ended up just basically writing down everything that you said about the characters in there because I I, I love them so much that, that it feels so um, fleshed out. But it does it feels real in in a way. I think I think even you saying nature is magic is a really great descriptor of the magic level. There there is <laughs> magic, but in the same way that in this world there is magic. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a little bit extra like you know, um, fantasy magic, but I think, for, yeah, definitely um, it's 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 na our nature that is, is the biggest inspiration. I mean, whenever I've watched, if I've been watching documentaries and I'll see something, I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna write that down. That's a really cool idea that, that could fit into a, you know, nature idea. Like the, the birds that eat the fairies and they eat the fairies in order to attract their mates. And then the different fairies eat the other fairies, and you know there's like little circles of life going on. I love, I love all that. It's 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 cool. It's magic. It's it's um, gorgeous stuff. It, it's almost this druidic uh, kind of quality where it's it's. I, I mean, a big inspiration for me when I'm when I'm uh, running tabletop RPGs is um, the work of Susanna Clark who wrote Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, and she sort of talks about magic being written on the clouds and in the rain, and and I, I don't know. I, yeah. I love this kind of built-in quality of, of um, nature is magic. That's what I'm grabbing yeah. onto. Yeah, 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 oh yeah. That's that definitely, that's the right vibe, I would say. <laughs> the right vibe. Um, I So it, for me, it has been very helpful that you did come up with these kind of rules, these ideas of, None of these creatures are, are dressing up like people. They're not wearing hats and waistcoats. Um, and, you know, people don't live inside Strange Hollow. These were rules that were passed on to us, uh, the, the writing team, as we were getting started. Um, and I found it, it really helpful to, to have those kind of structures around what you're working on. Has it been stressful for you uh, handing this over to a bunch of strangers and hoping that they'll get it and that they'll follow those guidelines? It's been really weird. It's been a really, really, because it, it's, I can't believe it. it's been seven years since I did the first book. It was very, very difficult to let go of it. And not because, I mean, mostly because of these particular rules, like because um, Jason and Mikey have been amazing and they both really get it. They they really do get the vibe. But they they were like, oh, could we have some people living on the outskirts? I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But yes, I'm totally okay with them on the outskirts, but I wouldn't have been okay with them in there because you know, like somebody's, more than one person has said, you know, oh, basically Strange Hollow is like Australia. Everything's trying to eat you <laughs> or sting you or whatever, you know, everything is dangerous. Um, but yeah, so it sort of seems, I, I wanted to keep it, I suppose, no, sacred is the wrong word, but I didn't want it to be infected by humans, basically in a sense. It's rather, I would, I'd rather it infect the humans than, you know, that are trying to interfere with it. And um, subsequently, you know, things happen to them if they go in there. I like I like the idea of it being really dangerous, you know, like like real jungles and forests can be. Oh yeah, it's, it's that kind of respect. <laughs> it's that respect yeah. for what is wild. Um, yeah. And I, I love that idea of it infecting civilization instead of the other way around yeah in fact i might be taking some inspiration from that just now in this moment for what i write hmm interesting i'm going to make a note of do, that it is really fun reading because i've read a little bit of brian one of brian's stories and i've read a little bit of ed what ed green was written and it's just it's a very surreal feeling that that people are writing stories in a world that came out of my head <laughs> It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. Um, and at this point, I am totally like, yeah, go, just, you know, have fun. Because you can't, yeah, because you can't, just like if someone gives me a really detailed 
description of what they want me to paint, it's going to be shit compared to, I don't, I must swear, I'm really sweary, so I've been trying really hard, sorry. So if they just say to me, um, draw uh, like a cute furry thing, that, it could be anything. I mean, obviously it's gonna be cute, but um, that's gonna make make me paint something better than if someone's given me this like really long list, of, like, ten characters in the picture, and it's like, oh my god. Uh, and I'm sure the same is if you've got too much information when you're writing about something. It's like, well, you just want to run with it, stretch your legs a bit. Mmm, stretch your legs. I like that. I like that a lot. Something you said made me think of. Um... Uh, a quote from Tolkien, from an essay that Tolkien uh, wrote called On Fairy Stories. And he was um, discussing the idea of fairy tales and the the concept or, or the belief that they're like stories for children. And he was saying, yes, but they're not only for children. Um, and that they're, they're not just about, you know, those pretty little dainty, friendly ones at the bottom of the garden. Um, they can yeah. be, it can be more than that. It can be deeper than that. It can be scarier than that. And he used a phrase that I often draw on, which is um, the adventures of of mortals on the borders of the perilous realms. And I feel Ooh. like, yeah, doesn't it just make you good? I love it. Yeah. I mean, Tolkien, you can't, you can't beat, but it's Tolkien. The guy knew what he was talking about. Uh, the guy you knew what he was talking about. Yeah, very good. And I do, you know, despite really wanting to do, um, like when I first started it, it was like, oh yeah, it's going to be really moody. It's going to be really dark and scary. But that is just not what comes out of me. It's, it's a bit silly. Um, you know, I'm, I am silly day to day. And and it, can't, it I can't stop that happening even when i do something creepy there's you know even if it's like mostly creepy there's still going to be a bit, little bit of that looks a bit silly about it yeah so it's either really silly with a tiny bit of creepy or it's quite creepy with a little bit of silly i can't get rid of the silly <laughs> you know you can't help what you are you, you know you you are what you are and and, and it just sort of yeah i i stopped fighting it about three four years ago and just lent into it, hence the little monster books as well. So. Oh, but it works so well. It's the light and shade of it for me that I think um, makes it so effective. Having that little bit of silliness and that little bit of spooky wrapped in together um, makes something that is so its own thing. You know, it's always going to have its own ratio of, of uh, whimsy to, to eeriness that is mm. going to, to make it... Um, significant and individual and um i keep f i'm trying to fight against using it but the word that comes to mind is special like it makes it this shiny little gem we we sort of brushed on past it very very quickly but you did mention uh, a couple of movies that uh, that have inspired you and your early concept of what fantasy is and looks like um mm. and you mentioned as well books that particularly had uh, beautiful images, beautiful art in them. What kind of what kind of books come to mind there? There was one called Gods and Monsters, and I think I, I think I have got it downstairs. Um, and it was very. Uh, it wasn't particularly. Well, it's not art that that I would like now. It was quite flat, but it's very very bold. And um, obviously, I would have been read these stories and looked at the pictures whilst I was being read to and it made a big impact and the old penguin books as well the one where the elves make make shoes for the oh, shoemaker over Cobbler. that's it yeah and I can't remember who is that a grim fairy tale I genuinely don't know I had forgotten about that story until you mentioned it just now that was one I loved as a kid and I loved like the cover of that book just completely enchanted me it was two little elves making making shoes um, uh, but things like that really, you know, that's like stuck in my brain. Um, the other book was, I was a bit older, probably towards my early teens, and it was lots of illustrations of Russian folk tales, and they were really dynamic. I, I can't, I'm, I would have to go and find find what the book's called. I've got it downstairs as well. But there were lots of like, like fantasy horses, like there was a horse that was plowing a field, but it was made of the sun or that it maybe was the sun i don't know but it like it's its mane was like gold you know it was a golden sort of fiery horse it was really cool and, and there were loads of images like that and then of course anything with horses in it like i was like oh my god horses 
so, <laughs> you know, and um, the the last unicorn obsessed. I was obsessed with that. Flight of dragons. I don't know if you've seen the Flight, Flight, of, dragons. Flight of dragons. I made my entire um, Twitch audience watch the speech that Sir Aaron Neville Smythe gives um, at the oh, end when no, he's no. about to fight Breog. Yeah. Um, it's deeply important to me in my heart is my answer to that. I watched those, both those like a million times as a kid, just like obsessed. So yeah, yeah, stuff like that. I mean, I feel bad that a lot of it is movies and not, um, and not books. I mean, there is, the book started it all, but then, you know, I, the visual, visual mediums love it. Oh, you know. oh yeah, no, I and and not to imply any kind of a hierarchy. My list here says books, animated films. It's it's uh, genuinely I think that um, particularly animated films or films with puppets, things like that. There is something about yeah. them that just yeah. kind of gets in your brain and it mm. shapes things. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so, so much for being here. Uh, Surviving Strange Hollow is on Kickstarter right now. There's a link in the description below. Uh, if you want to go check it out, we'd really appreciate the support um, because I think it's going to be a really cool thing. Thank you so, so much. Uh, uh, I'll, I don't know what my outro is. I no longer remember what my outro is. Thank you again to Emily Hare for putting up with my scattered, haunted interview setup. Uh, I loved getting to chat with her. And also thank you to Surviving Strange Hollow for sponsoring this video and putting the whole project together. The premise behind the setting is that it's art first. It's all based on the world and the watercolors that Emily created and now myself and a whole team of cool people are all writing narrative fiction based on that work. And then after all that, a game is being made out of it. So it's a really weird kind of cool process and I'm really excited to be involved with it. The Kickstarter is only open for a couple more days, I believe. So if you want to check it out before you miss your chance, the link is in the description below. Everyone, please, for the love of God, send me holy blessings that will banish Phantom Dennis from all of my various technologies. Please and thank you. Uh, apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done, email this to your grandma and I'll see you some other time. Honestly, I just, I, I, what would I do without Jack? Thank you so much, Editor Jack.